So uh, today we have two parts. The first part is um, I will describe in short uh, my uh, research on Venture Studios. So this paper I published three months ago. Uh, it went viral on LinkedIn. Uh, and then we'll have 45 minutes for discussions for all people who want to uh, share their thoughts on what are the biggest problems, what are uh, the solutions or advantages of studios and what might be an ideal studio. So we'll have 45 minutes to discuss. Um, yeah, about me, um, my name is Max. I'm created uh, three companies. But if you will wake me up in the middle of the night and ask what is my name, I probably say uh, Venture Studio. In 50% of cases, uh, I'll say Venture Studio because I did a lot of uh, projects around Venture Studios. So I did this research, uh, published three months ago. It went viral. Then uh, we uh, held two conferences for Venture Studios in November. Uh, one for the US and Canada time and one for Asia uh, and Australia. So Europe and Africa could uh, join um, both both conferences. Each conference uh, got more than 1,000 registrations and about six, 700 people uh, visiting uh, those conferences. Then I record uh, podcast interviews with Venture Studios um, we have a paid community for Venture Studios where studios share their numbers, documents, playbooks, uh, and investors. And also uh, we have an investment syndicate. So one, one deal is in the process, almost fi finished. Uh, and um, uh, we are now looking for some startups going out of studios to invest in, uh, in, in those startups. Um, for people who don't know what is a venture studio, I will explain. So a startup studio is organization which creates several startups a year, partnering with, um, with entrepreneurs uh, and going through different stages from ideation to growth. Uh, a team of 10, sometimes 20, sometimes 30 plus people uh, working uh, together with entrepreneurs and help uh, launch companies and reach product market fit faster, reach revenue faster. And also uh, this team, this studio usually invests money uh, uh, on pre-seed, sometimes, sometimes seed, and uh, rarely it is a Series A investments. Um, my, the name of my research is Numbers of Startup Studios uh, exciting and criticism of venture studios, and uh, I visited one. Um, I visited one uh, VC party, uh, and uh, there were a lot of different uh, investors and people from the VC industry. And so one of them uh, heard that I am doing something in startup studio ecosystem. He asked me. Uh, do you know what is a common refrain of startup studio founders? It was interesting for me because I was doing this, preparing this research. I said, no, what is it? Uh, and he said, there were $5 million just a moment ago, uh, ago. Where did it go? So like meaning that uh, usually studios waste a lot of money and uh, don't get some results. And then the second, uh, his phrase was, um, like to understand what a startup studio is and what it typically does, uh, you have to go to Wikipedia and uh, find the article with the name uh, Almshaus. Uh, he asked me, do I know what is uh, an Almshaus? I said, no. Uh, he said, okay, go to Wikipedia. So I went to Wikipedia and was humiliated uh, because I found that Almshaus was charitable housing provided to people during the Middle Ages. Uh, so for the people who couldn't pay the rent, uh, they were uh, maintained by charity in those uh, houses. So this was uh, a great example of skepticism around studios. And actually, there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, and I will go through eight problems with startup studios, and then we'll go to advantages. So the first 
problem is that it is hard to attract experienced founders because uh, they don't want to give up 20, uh, usually 35 or 40 percent of equity and sometimes like 60 and uh, in the very rare cases, 80 percent or 90 percent of equity to the studio. Um, and uh, they are more inclined or they are more motivated to just raise capital and uh, do their startup and not give up so much equity. Yeah, it's very difficult, but uh, how some studios try to attract founders, they are showing that even if you have initial less equity here, uh, still you skip some rounds. So in this case, it's very little like 0 0.1 and uh, you have improved chance of success. So like if you come to uh, ways to uh, to launch a startup with a studio or without a studio, so entrepreneur uh, could end up or result with, with higher uh, expected value. Uh, this is a model uh, by Purpose Built Ventures. Uh, there is a studio in the US. Um, I refer to, to this model and you can play with different figures and get different results. So like if you can convince your founders that with the studio, you have better chances uh, to create a successful startup uh, uh, which will be acquired, uh, this is um, the way to, to, convince, to convince founders. Uh, capital requirements, uh, I think for, uh, for the US, it's even bigger than one, two million. I think five, 10 million is uh, the, the most cases, at least what, what I've seen. And sometimes it's uh, even like from scratch, uh, some, some studios raise uh, 10 million fund, 25 million fund. Uh, if, of course, you have some track record previous to launch, to launch a studio, you need money. And without money, uh, it's very difficult to launch and it's very difficult to fundraise. Actually, uh, probably it is, it will be another uh, problem with the studio. Yeah, the median annual budget is uh, 1.4 million and the average 2.5 million according to GSSN data report uh, 2022. The third problem is broken cap table and complexities with future rounds, which means that this is when when they see uh, the cap table when a studio has 35% equity or 50% equity. So uh, it is red flag for them to, to invest in this startup. Um, in my research, the link is here, um, I mentioned uh, Fractal Venture Studio and some like scandal article about uh, that only one company out of 130 got Series A. Uh, and then uh, in one month, I, I published some additional information because uh, I talked to two people from Fractal who say that actually only one company out of the, uh, those 130 tried to uh, raise Series A. And uh, most companies were under two years old because uh, the studio started uh, in, in the, in the, at the end of 2020. So like most startups usually don't get uh, Series A rounds uh, so fast, but still, uh, still uh, having a huge amount of equity in a startup by a studio can create some difficulties. Um, why a studio takes more equity than other players, VC players? Because they're the only full-time co-founders. So they have uh, they have a team, dedicated team. And if you will divide the, uh, the team count on the number of startups, usually for a year, you'll find that uh, for each startup, Studio provides several full-time people uh, working. And um, in, in case of incubators, accelerators, it's only supporting role in case of most uh, venture capital firms. Uh, it is only like network and little support and only startup studios are working together. So um, VC firms couldn't say we co-founded the company. They usually say we invested in companies. Accelerators say we accelerated 1000 uh, startups 
for the 10 years for, for 10 years for example or uh, 100 startups or 50 startups a year but only studios could say we co-founded uh, we co-founded uh, let's say 10 startups during during three years uh, challenging to attract funding to a studio because um, investors usually don't understand how a studio works and very complex structures uh, make investors not willing to consider uh, this asset class or this investment because like when you look at the structures you, you just in 50% in of cases you just couldn't understand like what are those different fund uh, LLC uh, holding company then additional uh, holding companies and even if it's a very simple structure it's still um, still is difficult because uh, you have you can have some benchmarks for startups and you can have some benchmarks for funds uh, and uh, but for venture studios most investors invest first time in in a venture studio and it's very difficult to them to understand like do do I do something uh something completely wrong and very risky or it is a good idea to invest in a studio um one founder shared of a studio shared with me that uh, building a company usually is unprofitable so when you create a business it's in most cases unprofitable uh when you create a startup it's very risky it's even more risky because you are doing something completely new without uh in most cases, without some ready market for for your product, but uh, when you are doing a startup studio, it is uh, it is when something always go wrong somewhere. So, like you are looking at your five companies, and you have here you have problem, here you have another problem. And like it's very difficult, especially when you don't have some. Uh, playbooks or processes how to make it effectively how to launch companies effectively and i believe that it is very difficult model uh, to operate maybe maybe a bit more difficult than uh, just launching a startup or more difficult than uh, creating a vc fund um, another problem i think it's a very big problem uh, is uh, limited data on the effectiveness effectiveness of startup studios there are some uh, data on the performance, but still, um, when I was researching all the reports, I found that there are some potential biases. And now uh, I'm inviting a PhD researcher, scientific researcher, and I showed to him like my research. I showed to him all white papers and uh, even scientific researchers on venture studios. I said something like, if you can understand this scientific research about venture studios, um, you are a god for me. You are a god for me <laughs> because uh, you are a hero, superhero for me. Uh, because I was able to understand maybe like 60% or 50% of what was explained and written. Uh, what he said to me that like, oh, okay, so it is, there is a survivorship bias, there is uh, another bias, it's not so accurate to compare those different different numbers with each other. It's not clear what, what did they mean by by calling this, uh, let's say, st startup uh, coming out of studio or something else. And like now I understand that actually there is no uh, really data uh, where you can rely 100% sure that it is unbiased it is without some uh, flaws in, in the methodology. So, and this is what, what we plan to do in the next year um, to do, to create some research. Not everyone succeeds. So um, when I was reading uh, Startup Studio Playbook, there is a book written in 2016. Some then uh, there were, was a second edition in 2019, um, nine startup studios, uh, we were interviewed for this book in 2016, 2017. Uh, I checked all the websites, I contacted the founders and found that only three are still active. So like uh, three out of nine are still active. In uh, seven years, 
six in six seven years after interviews. Uh, then I I heard uh, that uh, Matthew Berries, uh, an expert in startup studios, uh, so he uh, mentioned that uh, based on Venture Studio Index database, um, only one third of studios are active still, and like two third uh, ceased their operations or just closed, uh, and also some um, very well-known accelerators like tech, uh, tech stars and 500 startups or 500 global now. So they launched their studios in 2016, 2019. The, now they are not operating. So studios also close. Um, and there is another problem. Uh, or it's maybe not a problem, but like a potential way to kill a studio is when one of your startups um, showing very good traction. This was the case of HVF uh, Studio by Max Levchin, a previous co-founder of PayPal. So when the company Affirm started to show great traction, after two years of this company, he became CEO of this company. Uh, and... Uh, like focused completely on growing this company. Finally, it went IPO, uh, but uh, but the studio is not so active. Yeah, so these were the problems. Uh, now I have a question, and now everyone can unmute themselves. Si vous comprenez cela, cela signifie que la grande recherche de sept mois sur les start-up studios réalisées par Max Pog a été publiée en langue française. So I mean, We're talking about how you're releasing the, the book in French, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, it's an announcement that um, I've published my research in French language. Actually, it was only one part of this research. So the problems uh, now I will go to the second part. But uh, it's also being translated into Spanish and Portuguese, uh, Brazilian version. And uh, if there are some people uh, willing to translate it into Italian, German, or some other languages. I would be open, open to, uh, uh, to collaborate on this. Now, uh, there are some advantages of studios. Speed, uh, you can compare um, studios with factories. So earlier there was a manual labor, then industrial revolution, and uh, Finally, you you can uh, you can understand that like the difference in in the speed is um, huge. The same with startup studios. So when you do independent startups, uh, you are figuring out every aspect of business uh, from scratch. And when you have some um, automated processes or when you have some experience, it's much easier to launch. Uh, the startup number 10th than the startup num number one in agritech or in healthcare. So uh, this is why studios are more efficient. And also uh, my research, so I took the Venture Studio Index data database, uh, including um, 1800 startups um, that were created in studios and compared this, uh, their traction or their fundraising rounds uh, from from foundation to fundraising rounds to exits with benchmarks that were available to me and found that uh, startups created in studios fundraise 40 to 50 percent faster and they exit about 30 percent faster than uh, conventional startups. So accumulation of industry experience uh, and expertise uh, when you um, so actually I, I said this, and a good example is OSS Ventures Studio, which visited factories 800 times. Uh, so when you when you created a lot of partnerships with your factories, you understand their problems. It's much more easier to sell, and they uh, they are able to sell uh, B2B SaaS for factories for manufacturing much faster uh, in comparison with just independent startups. So uh, when you are niche focused, I think there are big. Uh, advantages to uh, to to have a studio um, because you are using your customer bases. You're sharing 
uh, your team. In most startups, you don't have all full-time uh, employees. You can have your uh, studio at cost, uh, usually for free, uh, for one, two years of hands-on um, operations and support. And uh, it is... So when you have this team, it is uh, more efficiently because you, you cannot hire some agencies which usually have 4x margin uh, on their prices for per hour for, for their employees. Um, investment efficiency, there is uh, also, um, this is a paper by GSSN from 2020 showing, so this was based on 200, uh, about 240 plus uh, startups from studios. This um, this line, um, and it showed that um, those startups created in studios showed IRR of 53 percent. Um, and in comparison with VC during the same period of time, so we uh, usual startups generated 21 uh, percent IRR. Um, there is also one new um, um, paper by Vault Fund, uh, which shows that like 13% of venture studios that had some exits and shared their data with this fund, uh, they generated IRR of 60%. And uh, this uh, Vault Fund, they compare it to top quartile, um, 25% of the best performing VC firms. Uh, with thirty percent IRR, so uh, maybe we can we can say that like top quartile uh, studios generate higher returns than uh, than VC firms or than usual startups. But still, as I mentioned mentioned, um, there should be done more uh, independent research to compare independent independently data uh, to to answer. Uh, do they perform better or not? Uh, and also, I found this um, um, research or report by PitchBook showing uh, TVPIs of different accelerators of their startups. So, uh, and uh, I compared this, like, potentially, maybe it's not so accurate to compare, but uh, a founder which joins a studio uh, can maybe it's like going into YC or for investors investing in, in startups of studios, uh, it also potentially can mean that it's like, oh, it's like investing in, in YC startup or in YC itself. Um, reduce risks. Uh, if you launch 10 companies, and uh, eight will shut down, so you you still have two. In the case, if you are launching only one startup, uh, 80 or 90 percent probability that it will be closed. So with a startup studio, uh, it is a way to de risk your investments or your portfolio. Uh, like like there are no VC funds which invest only in one or two deals or three deals. Usually they invest in 20 companies, 40 companies. And uh, by this uh, numbers, you can find some outliers which will return your fund. Entrepreneurs can dedicate more time to core business tasks. Uh, I think it's obvious uh, that like when you have your back office team of a studio, uh, you, you cannot uh, ch choose, for example, uh, how our website will be will be done, or uh, how can we do our legal legal stuff, uh, so accounting and so on. Networking opportunities usually studios have uh, connections to VC firms, syndicates that invest in startups, and usually studios also invest their own money into startups. So uh, I know many cases when studios are even ready to invest until exit. Um, so they uh, they create su such a business model when even if entrepreneur gets small amount of equity, but they don't dilute. 
uh, this equity, for example, 30% until exit at 50 million, uh, 50 million or 100 million uh, valuation. So entrepreneurs can get it. Uh, in most cases, of course, uh, the shares are not so big. So studios take uh, 33% probably it is an average or something like around 30-35%. Uh, um, I rely on some research and data from like two years old, three years old. Um, and now I see many studios also take less, like 25%, 20%, uh, sometimes 15%. Uh, and uh, they they take less equity in those cases when there is also fund investing and getting preferred shares. For example, there is a case when a studio invests, um, let's say, $1.5 million per startup, and the studio takes 20% equity for their work of the ATM, and also the uh, fund takes 20%. So there are... Um, actually, this point was not about <laughs> not about the equity, but about uh, opportunities to fundraise. Uh, psychological comp compatibility for studio partners and founders. Uh, I interview many studio founders, and my last five interviews, <laughs> I see that probably all people have a lot of ideas, and uh, I think that many studio founders like me. And uh, I'm not a studio founder yet, but uh, I have this problem, uh, which which I call, uh, which is called uh, a shining object syndrome, when like some idea comes to you and you're like, wow, wow, I want to do it. Wow, this is a super idea. I want to dedicate my life to this idea. And you're working for the first uh, three months or one month, <laughs> and then you switch to another wonderful idea you want to focus on. And so uh, there are some ways. So some people, they uh, criticize this approach. So you are not finishing what you started. But there are also uh, people which build their portfolio in parallel uh, and they succeed with this approach. Atomic, for example, one of the greatest studios in the US. Uh, so they say that even when some startups are starting to uh, show great traction, we are not focusing on it. We credit our founders for these successes and we continue to, to launch uh, new companies. No, it, it's not this example for this, <laughs> for this case. But um, I wanted to say that there are just different approaches and it is normal to have many ideas. Uh, and uh, if you are a person having hundreds of ideas, uh, you can consider launching, launching a studio when you will be involved for the first one year or two years with a startup and you can do some companies in parallel, um, which is not possible if you are focusing on like serial entrepreneurship, launching one company in five or 10 years, selling it and then doing another company. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Is Emil Patrick here? Uh, because because he contacted me and sent some photo. Oh wow, super super! If you have some, if you have some nunchucks, <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> do sorry, it? I don't. No, sorry, ah. I don't have with me right now. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, yeah. This is yeah. So like, I do on my online calls uh, this thing, and yesterday Patrick sent me his nunchucks also. Okay. Sorry, I, I forget it uh, this morning at home. <laughs> okay, on, on, the, on the next uh, Venture Studio conference, uh, we'll do it together. <laughs> next, you. Time you, you, next time you come in Paris, in France, I will do a, a demo with you. Ah, super, super. Okay. So now the last part of my presentation is about like what must be an approach to build uh, to build a studio. So uh, taking into account all these problems and advantages, uh, what an ideal studio must be. So the first question I would suggest you to try to answer um, is like what is the key factor to define the studio success like if you choose only one factor 
try try to guess and suggest some uh, some answer in the comments after the presentation i will read every 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 comments um so uh, my opinion is that the quality of founders a studio is able to attract defines the uh, success of a studio so if if a studio is able to attract great founders it will have uh, great companies uh, showing um, showing big revenue uh, fundraising amounts uh, big big fundraising amounts from external investors uh, and uh, acquisitions um, and uh, um, there is a, a lot of statistics showing that some founders with previous exits are more likely to launch new successful company um, so this is like Previous companies founded zero. This means that five percent. It is a chance of uh, exit by a first-time founder, and by fourth company or fifth company, you have ten uh, percent. All the links to to all data I'm showing you can find all, all the sources in the research here. Um, so, uh, and uh, I saw that uh, some some article with the name like. VCs almost blindly invest in founders with previous exits because there is, uh, because uh, another some research showed that investing in founders with previous exits uh, generates high returns for VCs. Uh, and uh, here is very important idea on how studios can outperform in some way VCs. So uh, there is one... Uh, Paper showing research um, showing that um, if a top tier VC fund invests in average founder, just usual founder, um, so they like increase chances of success of this founder. So they add additional value, not only money. Uh, if, uh, but if uh, this top top tier uh, VC firm invests in uh, top tier founder. Uh, it is not adding additional value in terms of like uh, probability of exit or success of the company. Uh, so this means that for top tier founder, uh, they they can raise all all money from different company from different VC firms, even uh, no name VC firms. And they are the same. So, and here I think that there is an opportunity for studios to attract founders with uh, previous exits and, and add some value, additional value. Of course, most founders with previous exits will launch their studios when they will uh, know this model, when they will be educated around this model. So some of them will uh, want to launch their own studios, but still, uh, I know some studios focusing on exited founders, uh, and so uh, and and I believe that uh, the quality of studio founders, uh, their their previous experience and traction and track record, can can define the level of uh, founders a studio is able to attract. So, what must be the conditions to make it unreasonable for top tier founders uh, launch a startup without a studio? Uh, I think that niche focus can show real value. Uh, in case of OSS Ventures, because they visited uh, their customers and partners uh, 800 times, it is much more likely to, um, to really understand and add value to their founders um, than just uh, then if they like just invested in those uh, in those startups. So no no one VC firm can say that uh, we we have a base of like we visited factories eight hundred times. It it is one example. Um, but uh, when you have some niche and you're gathering uh, you you're gathering expertise around this, and you're not only have um, you're not only have your niche focus, but only a team which is focused around this niche, uh, you can say that like in three years every studio can say that we are the best at building such startups on this market 
if you can say this, founders will join. Uh, because uh, if they consider launching a startup in healthcare independently, where there is a lot of regulations, or uh, I don't know, uh, you, you have to uh, cold outreach your potential customers and partners, it's very difficult. And then you have some studio with experience of building 30 companies in healthcare, and you are partnering with the studio, so it's much more easier to, to develop a company. If the studio is the best, in launching healthcare companies in specific region or in specific focus. Um, so more and more experienced founders will join the studio. I believe that in long term, those studios um, will be like magnets of expertise. And uh, they will they will be able to outperform all independent startups and independent uh, companies uh, launching launching in this field. Um, another research showed that founders with three years of niche experience uh, are more than two times likely to establish a top 0.1 high growth startup, uh, whatever it means. Uh, I believe it, it, it was like uh, research with 10 years of experience in specific industry. Uh, I think the chances are more. And so a studio, a niche studio, especially with niche team, has opportunity to, uh, so actually they, they are like an entrepreneur who built 10 companies in a specific uh, area. Uh, and uh, this is why uh, they can outperform independent startups. Um, lean startups, so there is a picture showing that uh, earlier it was easier to fundraise uh, without revenue, and now you have to you have to show that your customers pay you to to fundraise. So, for example, if you compare this seed round in 2022, 73 percent of of those uh, had revenue. Actually, um, if you so if you will deduct Web three startups from from this. Uh, sample uh, here will be seventy six percent. But like in twenty twelve, there was twenty five percent of companies with the revenue on on seed round. And even if you compare with let's say Series A, so twenty eight percent here. Um, so um, I think that one of the biggest values of. Uh, uh, Startup studio is to reach product market fit faster and to reach revenue faster, and you can compare the effectiveness of, of a studio by uh, by this number. Like, if your studio can reach revenue in four months uh, for your startups uh, in your focus, and independent startups reach revenue in eight months, so you are doing good job, and uh, it is more efficient. You will fundraise faster and you'll build more viable startups. And of course, like uh, create companies with positive unit economics, especially during VC winter, uh, it's difficult to fundraise. And so uh, if you are not completely dependent on external capital, uh, you're in a better position. And uh, Lean Studio means, so yeah, Lean, Lean Startups and Lean Studio means that uh, you can leverage, you can use uh, geographic arbitrage when you have some some of your team uh, where your customers are based, for example, in the US, and some of your team uh, outsourced or you have remote team with low living expenses. And so you can, uh, you can be more uh, efficient, capital efficient in comparison with, with big companies. Actually, uh, I interviewed many Already, almost I call it many. Uh, still, it's maybe like six, uh, eight interviews with uh, those studios which uh, which are doing corporate venture building. Uh, and the the usual case here is that um, they like companies invest a lot of money, but it's not so efficient. Uh, because like uh, you hire a big team of 20 people or 30 people from scratch and it is less likely to uh, to 
to create positive unit economics in uh, in in some I don't know in several months or in, in one year or two years. So um, I believe that being efficient is uh, is important. Uh, using AI tools, actually, I have to delete it when I was written uh, was writing this uh, paper. So it was like, oh wow, GPT four, amazing! <laughs> and now it's obvious. Uh, then stage gate model, but not for startups, uh, for but for uh, for studios themselves. So I I suggest some model on how to launch uh, studios. Uh, in a capital efficient way, I will show you later. So this is the number of studios on uh, actually the last number is 896 on startup studio map by Enhance Ventures. Uh, and still, I think that many that not many, but like the studio uh, model is in the early adapter phase, and there is somewhere the chasm between early adopters and early majority. And there should be done a lot of education uh, and maybe some startup uh, standards should be developed to cross the chasm and to uh, to have more venture capital funds investing in studios, investing in their startups, uh, understanding the studio model, more founders willing to join a studio, more founders, uh, existed founders launching their studios, yeah, and here is uh, my almost last slide. Um, here I show the Lean stage gate model, like launch, execute, advance, and independence, uh, where first you are solving the chicken egg problem. Chicken egg problem, uh, meaning can you attract at the same time founders and investors? Um, if you if you can create some uh, event around your studio, if you can attract a lot of founders, if you can attract investors willing to support your studio, uh, you're raising uh, up to $2 million um, into your holding company for the first two years. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe for the US, uh, this number should be a bit bigger. But uh, your, your purpose here is to show that even without investing those money directly in cash into your startups, uh, you can show that your unit economics of a studio shows good TVPI. So if you can reach TVPI of three in two years, this is a good result. And you probably you can raise uh, your funds showing that, look, we are we are showing very good economics with, with our startups. Our startups got uh, external funding from external investors. Uh, and uh, this is why we are raising this fund. Yeah, the third is... Uh, you're launching the fund, and then if you are able to exit your first company during the first six, seven years, uh, you continue, uh, like, you, you cannot dilute your uh, equity in the holding company of, of the studio, and you can continue to raise uh, additional funds, and usually studios develop, like, first they, uh, they start with the holding company. Uh, in two years, three years, or four years, they raise their fund. And then uh, and later, they every two, three years, there is uh, bigger funds uh, to launch more companies and to scale. Uh, yeah, this is the end part of uh, last part of my presentation. Um, we have this is a advertising slide. Uh, we have a venture studio family paid community for studios, um, 25 studios maybe now 27 or something are now in the community. And uh, there are some studios from New Zealand, Australia, uh, Singapore, uh, India, uh, many European studios, uh, Africa, uh, US and Canada. Um, so uh, what, what is happening inside? We have two calls, uh, closed calls uh, a month. One is for sharing Best practices, for example, the next Tuesday, uh, December 19th, there will be a call regarding uh, attracting founders into studios. Uh, so sharing best practices, every studio shares like, how, how do we create pipeline of founders? How do we attract founders? What are our terms for founders? Uh, how much salary do we pay? Uh, how, how can we attract better founders? than usual founders who are not like first-time founders. 
Uh, and another call a month is for all requests. So like any question, if you have any question, you ask and you get feedback from experienced studios. There are uh, experienced studios. I think that from those 25 plus, around half of them are very experienced, meaning that they launched their funds, raised funds, launched uh, maybe 10 plus companies. Uh, and also there are some emerging studios or new studios. Uh, and uh, so it is very beneficial for everyone to understand different uh, different best practices regarding fundraising, attracting founders, creating uh, cash flow for your studio, uh, agreements between founders and studio, agreements between a studio and uh, investors. So uh, yeah, and inside we, um, what we are focusing, we are sharing numbers. So we are uh, fostering sharing numbers inside those uh, calls um, we are sh we will have some exchange of playbooks and uh, docs and decks uh, and also we'll uh, create some events uh, with investors we'll invite our investors from our investment syndicate uh, we'll engage with family offices and invite them for our events and also every studio can attract one one of the investors uh, and get access to investors to other many investors who understand the studio model yeah, if you want to join, just uh, go to this website. The second part is uh, discussions. And I um, I want to uh, invite, so if you want to discuss, so my, my first question will be like, what is your biggest problems? Uh, what do you think are the biggest problems of studios? Uh, yeah, raise your hand. So everyone who wants to participate, raise your hand. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, I will remove spotlight. Yeah, and let's let's discuss. Okay, Denis. Max, thank you very much. It's um, it's a very good opportunity, and uh, I think you you done a great job uh, for everybody who are uh, in this business. Um, I am one of uh, I'm co-founder of one of the three uh, studios uh, from uh, uh, Playbook Startup Studio Playbook by Attila yeah. Siget uh, that uh, uh, we were succeeded to survive till now. Um, so I want to to make two points on what you on, on your great uh, uh, investigation of of studio models and one at the end one one i think difficult is that we should go through try to go through so the first one i think that is very important uh, to understand that most of the statistics that we have now is the statistics about startup studios that are doing let's say software startups in but any case it's a it will be different it, it, yeah and if we will look to deep tech to hardware and and I know it's very well because my startup startup studio was focused on this, and is focused on this uh, um, points uh, on this techno type of technologies. Uh, it will be very different. So and there is minimum differences in first of all um, the size of capital. So yeah. companies in electronics and in robotics and so on needs much more capital than the companies in. Uh, I don't know in a, in a software in a, uh, e-commerce and so on to start. And the second point is a length of the capital, because as you probably know, uh, the timing that, that startups needed to go to exit in software companies are minimum twice less than in deep tech and the hardware companies. It means that you need much more longer capital and for example in our startup studio uh, at the beginning in 2013 uh, we expected the first cycle the length of the first cycle between 12 and 14 years mm -hmm. so it means that you that you need very specific type of capital i think if you will follow up your uh, uh, analysis next year i think it's it's important to trying to differentiate these two groups of startup studios we will and and, yeah. and and different types of statistics so that, that is that is extremely important that is the first point of, that i will yeah uh -huh, yeah i have a list Sorry. of at least 40 deep tech studios and we have to uh, like compare their uh 
number selection and like I, I understand that it's completely different information. Exactly, exactly. So I, I think it's 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 around ten percent of the of the whole uh, numbers of startup studio now is that they are focusing in hardware and deep tech. And the second point, I think it's also important to dif- to differentiate uh, in, a, in, a, in a community of startup studios. Of course, you are focusing on startup studios that are uh, working around founders. And you're always mm-hmm. telling that his experienced thousand, uh, founders are, are extremely important. But there are definitely some studios that working without founders, so that substitute founders itself, especially in regions where there is no too much experienced founders. Uh, mm-hmm. If we are looking to the Silicon Valley or to the UK, you will not find such type of studios. But if we are look, if we, if we look to the other regions with a lack of the founders, with a deficit of the entrepreneurship, especially technology entrepreneurship, you will definitely find another type of the studios that that are substitute founders that are act as as the founders themselves and they they change people they change co-founders they change uh, founders in in a re- in a residence through the process of uh, building of uh, startups and i think it, it's also very different models one that is uh, like uh, uh, one of the partner of enhance called uh, exoskeleton around uh, founder it's one model, and another one is a substitute substitution of founders. It's uh, two different types of the startup. Too. And only one point to, to your conclusion that I wanted to add. Uh, I, I agree with the most that you that you told about the focusing and so on, but I think there is also one more advantage that startup studio could bring in a market, uh, and especially compared to the venture funds, it's a uh, uh, cost of management fee. Uh, mm-hmm. To be true, the best version is to go out of management fee. So zero management fee, but much larger part of the upside. So if motivation of the founders of startup studio will be fully in upside, but not mm-hmm. in management fee, it will be much more, it, it will equalize their uh, interest to the investors' interests. And there will not, not be any conflicts between between motivation of founders of startup studios. They will not become a managers of a new type, as as your, for example, guests of your podcasts uh, tell a few times that he doesn't believe in venture funds anymore because ninety percent of them are are just managerial manage, uh, venture funds and they just turning the money and so on and so. On. So that is that I wanted to add to your uh, uh, results. Thank sure. you. Sure. But yeah, once again, thank, thank you very much for, for this for this job. Yes, it's fantastic. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah, uh, Denis, we will record the podcast with you. I know you have some uh, disruptive thoughts about venture studios, and I would be uh, very happy to discuss it with you. Yeah, Constantine, please. I've talked to several startup studios, uh, the new ones, the uh, the wannabe startup studios since uh, uh, since the last webinar and. There is so much uh, illusions and uh, misunderstanding about this business that uh, I would like to offer a uh, mental solution because, uh, you know, we, we've got a huge crowd here. Uh, it's like a global community of various profiles. And uh, what it resembles uh, is a uh, movie industry, right? So uh, the process of raising money and, uh, you know, developing uh, your product, it's like TV series or a startup, uh, it's almost the same. If you produce uh, unicorns, that's basically producing blockbusters for, uh, you know, movie theaters. It's a different story, but it's usually not for startup studios. I'm not addressing the experienced people uh, with, uh, you know, huge assets under management like my neighbor, Rene uh, from New York, uh, because they they know what they do. But the the problem is that, uh, you know, almost nobody talks about what they plan to produce. I mean, startups are not commodities, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, we will grow grain and sell it. I mean, it's it's art, uh, believe it or not. So when you say that, you know, we will produce startups in healthcare, it doesn't say anything, basically. 
it's like it sounds like a bastardized version of uh, of a VC fund. Like yeah, you you failed to get hired by a VC company. Okay, I, you found a startup studio. That doesn't work that way. So uh, what I suggest is that having this community, we can view that as equivalent of uh, you know movie industry. Uh, which has many, many layers, many, many players, like, you know, huge studios that acquire other studios that specialize in a, in a very specific thing, right? Because otherwise we will drown in commoditization of startups, which will never see the, uh, you know, the light of day, because it's it's not that, that you know, people should understand what they do, uh, what problem they solve which is not the case so far because we're lost in conversations of problems that we don't have yet. Like, where do we find founders for startups? Okay, we have to decide what kind of startups first. A and it's not description of like, you know, healthcare. Healthcare has, I don't know, probably, you know, 20 different verticals, right? And yeah, if you yeah, don't understand... Yeah. I should... I should niche it down later. So, of course, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not about, it's not about niching. I, I just encourage uh, everybody to specify their concrete capabilities and specialization. And then the community will become the industry, which will eventually replace a large chunk of, uh, you know, VC and PE industry as they uh, are now, because there's a huge potential in that. But we shouldn't commoditize, you know, production of startups. It's it's like producing movies with about the same success rate, right? So many will fail because you don't understand the audience, or there is a you know execution risks and uh, yeah, marketing risks and uh, all that stuff. But if we view our products the same way as we uh, as if we were, you know, movie producers. That's a completely different thing. That's a, a different mentality we should, uh, I'm sure we sh should switch to because we can't go to uh, the uh, startup studio industry from the angle of finance managers. That's the, you know, death row. I mean, it doesn't work that because money is not the, the value itself. I'm not an expert, Thank but I think that's still investors for uh, movies are also like have some benchmarks and some IRR. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, uh, you know, you, you bring them the script and you bring them the cast, right? Uh, so like, here's the script. And Robert De Niro uh, said that basically, if you finance this, uh, he will play, right? And then you start, you know, raising money and so forth and you uh you may syndicate uh investment from uh various sources and uh, so forth and so forth it's it, everything has been invented but in another industry there are only a few modifications that uh, we may make but we shouldn't come from uh from the financial industry because it's a, it's a completely different thing we produce value not money and then how to uh transform this value into uh, monetary return, we already know that's not a huge science. But, you know, first things first, value should come first. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Rene? Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I think I think the other challenge here, uh, Max, is that there are, I've, I've spoken to, I don't know, 30 or 40 studios in the last couple of months. There are enormous variations in the model and mapping that out is really important both from an lp perspective but also in, in terms of figuring out which models work or don't uh, a lot of the challenge that i'm seeing is that studios have like enormously different de-risking models um there there's a digital health care studio here in new york very smart guys but their de-risking model is spray and pray like a vc which kind of defeats the purpose of having a studio uh, others take as you already addressed, this extraordinary amounts of equity, which makes it harder to find the best founders. Uh, and it, mapping all of that out, I think, is really important to adjust for the success rates. We, for example, only build one to two companies a year. So that that notion of serial versus parallel entrepreneurship. Um, so we fall on the side of 
you can't do too many of them because if you're doing too many of them, you're not doing the hard work of building those companies and de-risking them up front. And, and that's a challenge, right? So they're mapping out all of these things, I think, as the next kind of iteration of the research and showing which models work in which circumstances, because it is, um, I think, as, as uh, Constantine was just saying, it depends on the industry focus that you have, but it also depends on the specific startup. I just met with one this morning that's doing work in clean tech and, you know, the specific company that they're building, the area, generally speaking, you have to create, you know, the right model for, but then the specific startup may have a different business model that you need to address as well. So there are layers of, of how you create the, the uh, pipeline for talent uh, and how you create the pipeline for customers as well. Um, so all of that stuff, I think there's still a lot of mapping to do to try to figure out where the success rates are. I mean, we're, we're quite successful, but I don't think it's the only model, right? And, and I'd really love to, I'm happy to talk to you about this offline, but I'd really love to figure out the next tracks of research that get us closer and closer to figuring out which models work under which circumstances. Uh, one thing, by the way, the, the, the one big issue that I'll say last, last word, Max, is um, I have trouble there's bootstrapping, but I also have trouble. So the studio that I met with this morning, it's just two people. The problem with having a studio with just two people and they're, and they're capitalized only $3 million. Your resources are so restricted that it's very difficult to do that, that work of building startups. Uh, so to me, I, I would love to see research on this, but to me, I find it hard to believe that any studio with less than at least double digit millions in capitalization can build the team that you need in order to actually build these startups effectively, uh, rather than just being a founder yourself and building one company, right? Um, so that's another area I'd love to see um, from a research perspective. Mm -hmm. So, like, how how do not non US studios how how do <laughs> they create teams of like ten to twenty people with with single single uh, digit million number uh okay yeah about models uh, my small comment by the way our studio is uh is uh, tel aviv based it's not us based uh, yeah. uh also similar <laughs> idea similar idea right it's there's there's financing yeah. there that's that's capable but i mean look the, the level of financing that you need is going to vary but i think the ability to have at least a core team of a few people that specialize in the specific categories that you need in order to create early stage startups that's what I'm interested in understanding, right? How do you do that? And and some of the, by the way, I spoke to a, a, a you know relatively big studio created by VCs for their own deal flow. Uh, this is a life sciences one, and they only invest uh, a few hundred thousand dollars, but they raise a sixty five million dollar fund for operations, right? So so they actually have the people there. The other mm -hmm. the other question here is the amount of money that you invest in your startups really has a lot to do with that speed that you were talking about of getting to series A and beyond. And, you know, we invest five to $8 million once we bring the founders on board, even before we've created the company, we finish ideation with them. And that helps a lot to accelerate. Now, sometimes you have to fire them, right? And, and it's milestone driven drawdowns, but investing very small amounts of money means on the tail end of this, unless you have an extraordinary, like this studio, which was built by BC. So you have the, the, the seed funding built into it in a way, right? Even though it's not part of the studio, so otherwise, you're spending a lot of time and effort socializing this with your network of VCs to try to get that funding, and that's going to impact your speed to market as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember that uh, when I was recording uh, an interview with uh, Ben Yaskovitz from Highline Beta, uh, so uh, he said that like it's actually not a problem that many studios are completely different because I earlier thought that, oh, this is a problem. All studios are different, and the most popular message I get on LinkedIn is, uh, Hi, Max, I read your report, but we are a bit different studio from all studios. <laughs> and like, I think that there are more different, like, un uncommon studios than some common studios. So, and there are really a lot of business models, uh, a lot of equity splits, uh, and a lot of like structures, which makes it difficult but at the same time like everyone was trying to innovate and find some better way to launch companies simultaneously so it's like uh, 
bad and good uh, at the same time. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's it's we we are at that stage right now, right? Where people are trying out different models. That's why I'm saying I think I mean some of them. I think just taking a look at it, I find hard to believe they're going to succeed, right? But mapping out now as people are are innovating in the space. What are the things that are starting to succeed or not? And there are some studios that already have a multi-year track record that you can start to tap into. Um, but but following that as it evolves and and kind of being able to guide the community as to what types, you know, which models and which circumstances work, uh, I think that's hugely valuable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rana. Let's take Alexei. I have a couple of questions to you, uh, to you, Max, and to everyone else who thinks that knows the answers. So uh, I'm a student, I'm studying in Amsterdam, and I'm thinking about working in a startup studio when I graduate. The first question is, how do I tell the difference between a good star startup studio and a bad one from the perspective of a, of a potential employee, especially considering that I'm in my early stage of a career and that's a risky choice for me? And um, second of all, what hard skills would you recommend me to develop in myself so that I maximize my chances of getting into a good startup studio and uh, succeed at being uh, part of this type of organization. So I think uh, to, to distinguish different studios, we have actually uh, uh, in plans to create some sort of marketplace of studios where you can compare the uh, they with different uh, terms for entrepreneurs. I think this would be that would be very useful for many founders considering joining studios. I think that um, just looking at the founders, like did they have previous exits? How many companies have they launched? And are these companies uh, successful or not? Uh, can say a lot about, about the studio. Um, I would try to develop, so from, from the perspective of studios, what questions studios ask, um, ask uh, their potential founders? Like, Tell about your the most difficult stories uh, and how you were able to overcome those. So they are looking for some entrepreneurial uh, mindset or skills when when a person can find some uh, uh, some decision where everyone couldn't find it. So if you will have some entrepreneurial experience, I think it will be useful to show. So what I would try to do uh, to launch some. Uh, pet projects or small small companies or small ideas at least like think and feel like an entrepreneur when you have your own money uh, at risk and uh, when you when you are looking for how to make it profitable as soon as possible got it thank you uh -huh. aslan great uh, hi colleagues uh, my name is aslan i am uh, a corporate innovator comp corporate reformer who does some transformations inside companies, uh, and uh, also has been involved in startup studio building. Um, I have a question to the community um, about the, the thing uh, everyone speaks about, the, the, that attracting founders is actually the key point in, success, in succeeding startup studio. My experience is limited to a corporate space. So I went in a way where, where, where I've been uh, raising up founders internally, and it was a good model that brought results. But as I see startup studios that do it as 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 business in in the wild, um, are putting founders as a key factor. Does anyone actually uh, did anyone actually try to raise founders rather than attract them? How does it work? Is it is it a viable model? Uh, can anyone share some experience here? Um, yeah, if someone wants to to answer, feel free. If someone wants to answer in the comments, uh, do it in the comments. The question was, is it possible to build your own founders rather than attract them? Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't nothing. be a to overcome competition uh, for founders when you just grow them up. You don't chase yeah. them. Hi, this is. I mean, I, I think it's actually not a bad idea. I mean, especially in areas where you need deep expertise. So, like life sciences, where you're doing research or medicine, you really need to understand that the business side and the in here and the life sciences side, for example, right? Where they may not be entrepreneurial, there may be, you know, there may be academics, for example. Um, and I'm dealing, you know, I'm dealing with some 
uh, universities at the moment where it's absolutely like that. You know, they're all researchers, they're all PhD or postdoc or heads of department. Um, but they're not they're not commercial, they're not entrepreneurial, they don't do go to market, they don't know how to build a business, they're all researchers. So what I'm seeing is that there's definitely opportunity there to do that. And on the other side, early founders or professionals, so I'm dealing with a, another a healthcare venture, and she is a, a consultant psychiatrist. And, you know, she spent 20 years being a consultant psychiatrist, you know, as that's what she does for a living. And she's not really built a business or scaled a business before. And therefore, helping to do that, I think, is, is, is that, frankly, I'll be honest with you, it's actually easier. Because <laughs> when you have founders who have expertise, you then get all of the hassle, that all of some of the stuff we've been talking about. <laughs> you get the hassle with them about well, what's the equity, what are you going to do? And it just becomes a bit of a nightmare. And I'm always a fan of also finding amazing people who are great at what they do and giving them a business. So, okay, look, build this business. Um, but obviously, support you put the support around them. It's not just here, go and get them with it. You know, that's what the venture studio model is. You help them support it. But if you can find those people who are commercially savvy, strategic, you know, um, I'm, uh, we do technical stuff, technology, you know, uh, led. Um, and then, you know, you can shape those, you know, there are ways of shaping those people to make them successful founders and, and venture and, you know, building ventures. The, the point is that when you take a, you don't know, a high post student who is a very uh, bright person and has a, he has, has great motivation, he's eager to succeed and he's uh, a very well, well, he's a good learner. Uh, well, in a year or so, the person becomes capable of doing Quite complicated projects by by him or herself, um, but but as I see, startup studios don't have this time. And that's why they have to chase founders rather than raise them. So that that was my question: Is there a model? Is there anyone uh, who does this model who raises founders you know, rather than chases them? Um, well, could you please share experience? Yeah. Or maybe, maybe, maybe I don't think you can do. Them? I don't think you can do both. Uh, uh, I think you need to do both, uh, Aslan. So I'll tell you the model that we use. So first off, a comment on university researchers. Um, I did tech transfer for Columbia University for many years in health sciences, uh, uh, digital digital health, nanotech, et cetera. I teach lean startup for the National Science Foundation. I've coached hundreds of teams. Very difficult road to hoe. Um, you have to separate a lot of wheat from the chaff to get to somebody who actually has the capability of being a true founder. Um, it, it's not impossible, but it's a lot of work to get to those. A model that we use is we actually encourage and we accelerate vesting for employees who want to join a founding team. And we do this on a regular basis. Why? Because these are folks who are working at our foundry building startup companies, and they learn how to do it more and more over time as we bring junior people up. And we're comfortable because they've received training from us. So that's not a bad way of getting founders who, who you have some comfort and faith in, that they're actually going to build something that's aligned with your method as a studio. And I think it's, it is going to vary somewhat by studio. Um, there are sometimes folks from industry, but same challenge as with academia, right? If you get somebody from, from a large company that's used to having a lot of resources and a big team around them, they may not always be the best founders. In fact, a lot of times they're not the best founder. So you have to do a lot of separating the wheat from the chaff. And, and I think in order to get good founders, you have to apply all of these methods on an ongoing basis. But you can't, you can't go down the rabbit hole with any one of these because it'll suck up all of your time. Right. And, and you know, with the NSF, as an example, out of the 2,500 teams that have gone through the i process, the Lean Launchpad process, 1,400 have become startup companies and have raised collectively three and a half billion dollars. Of those though, we don't have the stats yet and, and, and the NSF isn't releasing yet, them yet. How many of these actually became successful? And here we're trying to train them through boot camps. In fact, multiple boot camps on how to build business models and be founders. And I think it's probably the most successful at scale version of doing this, but still the funnel is very wide and, and narrows very much. So. It's a balancing act, right? Picking all of these different avenues, but not spending too much time on any one avenue. 
good afternoon or good morning wherever you are <laughs> different time zones thank you so much uh, max for putting this together i am definitely a, 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 a total novice at this so <laughs> forgive me if i'm asking a very naive question here um uh i run a, a currently an incubator here in uh toronto uh, canada a suburb of it called brampton uh called brampton venture zone which is a technology startup incubator and we have been trying to think about a potential pivot to a studio model um inadvertently or i I did not know about studio models at all until I met Max or my colleague had found him. We, we were just running our incubator the way we thought that would make sense in our particular jurisdiction. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, when you just said this, like, every studio says we are different. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say we are different again. <laughs> we don't know, um, you know, if there are models that exist like ours. I'm uh, not sure. So I want to if it's okay, Max, I want to explain what it is briefly and then ask for advice on, you know, is it even possible to think a, a studio model mm -hmm. from, uh, from where we are? So uh, we've been running for four years as a technology startup incubator. We're focused on a particular jurisdiction, an area called Brampton. And I don't know if anybody in the call is from Canada, but they would know us. But uh, we, we pick the industries based on the strengths of the region. So in logistics, food sustainability, and in health. And uh, we were just running a regular incubator model. However, our, the way we did things where we always did a, something called a problem lab to solicit problem areas from both public and private sector, and then really honed in on specific areas. Like in health, we would say things like, you know, chronic, chronic health disease management because this type two diabetes is very high in this region or uh, mental health issues under uh, 24 year olds, because that's a problem in this area. So we had curated the problem areas. And then we went and found uh, founders to 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 who are interested in solving those problems. So m many of our health uh, startups uh, were from from the industry practitioners. So we were just talking about that, but you know, having uh, industry background. So they are physicians or registered nurses or MD, PhD. So if they're from the industry, the average age of the startup that we or the individual we see is around 35 to 38. That uh, seems to be this kind of sweet spot of people who want to build something. Sometimes we help them find co-founders. We actually give them $20,000 to be in the incubator for the seven month period and basically to help them build the business um, in that in that period of time. We don't charge for the services. We are funded by the city of, of Brampton. We don't take equity. It's essentially an economic development play. But what we realized in the four years is, you know, and then in success wise, and I think not, no huge numbers, but essentially out of 43 companies we've graduated, 38 of them are still operational. And about 11 or 10, I would say 10 of them have collectively raised about 10 plus million in dilutive capital. So not huge numbers, but, you know, <laughs> modest for the small incubator that we are. But what we have really want to, to do next is, you know, it's, it is truly an economic development play in the sense that we want to go in a studio, uh, venture studio model in order to increase the sticky factor of, of, of startups to stay in our jurisdiction. So we're thinking, is there a possibility of, um, be a little bit more heavy handed with how we work with our uh, start up with our startups as in, you know, kill ideas rather than being on the sideline, helping them build a business in an incubator model, but really be a bit more involved in uh, the actually the startup uh, success and take equity and have a fund associated with it. I should also say that we are, you know, it's the university kind of delivering this uh, for the city and our university is building a medical school. So we're Yes, a little bit weird in the sense that we're funded by the city. There is some private sector dollar, but we. I, I, my question related to this context is, are there venture studio models that are, are funded by public sector dollars and a fund that is associated with it, which could be a private-public partnership? I don't know. I'm, uh, I, I would love to get some feedback on the, the amazing people on the call who may have experience in this type of you know, uh, kind of models or in the health side of things? Well, I'm, I'm currently uh, trying to experiment with this public uh, private model uh, in France. I'm not sure about the, uh, you know, success. It's it's currently uh, in its initial stage, 50-50, uh, 
and uh, private uh, public sector doesn't really want to spend money because uh, it's all about their reporting uh, problems. It's difficult to report, but uh, they can participate with uh, infrastructure and uh, specialists from the public sector. They can fin finance them and give it to you for free, right? And that's, uh, I think, the only viable opportunity for public-private partnership in most of the countries, unless it's something like, uh, I don't know, Russia, China, where we uh, don't know how that uh, happens uh, and it's not strictly business. Um, so I'll, I'll let you know if that works out for me in, in uh, between France and Poland. Uh, but uh, the second thing I was, uh, I was going to say uh, is about composition of uh, startup founders. I spent quite some time teaching uh, at the university and my students were masters in, uh, well, let's say innovation commercialization. So basically want to be uh, entrepreneurs. And I discovered that, okay, for a technology startup, uh, you, you usually need two founders, one from business with business mind, entrepreneurship and all, all that stuff. Another one is from the industry. If it's like deep tech or uh, anything like really uh, technology related, it should be someone very, very experienced with deep knowledge uh, uh, of the industry. So if your startup studio uh, involve, uh, uh, implies your serious intervention into the strategy of the startup. Basically, you take care of the strategy. Uh, you may take a young entrepreneur and basically grow him into a person who runs the business. But the second uh, uh, founder, actually the third, you're the first one, the second one is the uh, person, young person who runs the business, who will listen to you. Because uh, if it's a mature entrepreneur, sometimes it's difficult to uh, tell them what to do, right? So, uh, but you've got your strategic uh, agenda. And the third person is from, uh, could be from academia with uh, a deep knowledge of, uh, the, of the industry and technology and so forth. That basically works if you can manage those uh those two people in case one is young and aspiring it's manageable because uh you know you you basically have a certain amount of control over what's going on in the company yeah i mean uh, just to your comment about the public private the cities in um uh, interest seems to be that if they, they feel like if they have a fund, which, which, you know, in Canada, you know, we suffer from uh, a lot of our founders having to go down south uh, to US to get their early stage pre seed seed funding because we don't have enough capital uh, here in Canada. So for them, the, the incentive seemed to be, you know, I will give you money to run the studio if I can participate as an LP in a fund. To get money back, but also it attracts new uh, founders to my city that can bring economic development to my city. So that seems to be their interest um, uh, from a from a you know contribution perspective. Um, and then to answer your question on the founders, the founders that are coming to us, they are not on seasoned entrepreneurs. They're just from the industry, and they seem to be older. In from the industry, but they've seen these problem areas and they feel frustrated. They feel like, okay, you know what? I need to solve for this because I, I keep hearing it over and over again. Nobody seems to be solving for it. I would love to step out of my traditional role and actually do something. And so we pair, try to pair them with, like you said, business people who maybe sometimes they bring somebody they already know, like a, a, a co-founder who's a friend or a colleague or somebody who has a different skill set than them uh to to work together and, and sometimes we help them find so that's um yeah but i i i hear your 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 I, point <laughs> see the I, listening <laughs> yeah i i agree i well the the point is also that uh those two founders have be uh must be uh you know what one should have uh the so-called primary creativity he invents things and that's usually uh someone from uh like academia or from from the industry uh, and another one uh, has secondary creativity. He or she implements 
uh, those ideas creatively. Mm. So if you've got this combination, usually, I mean, you, you can't have uh, those two functionalities in one brain because uh, it's, uh, you know, schizophrenia. Brains <laughs> don't work that way. Uh, so uh, unless unless you've got Prince, but he uh, he, he has passed uh, a few years ago and there are not, not too many people uh, like that. I yeah, but I, I agree. Uh, yeah, basically, we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that. So one additional comment here, which is, I've spent a lot of time doing science and technology, economic development work mm -hmm. with countries, states, cities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, look at what's being done in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I did this actually as part of my studio because they were a, an LP, George Kaiser Family Foundation. When I did this for the New York Academy of Sciences, um, one of the things we realized early on is as soon as the administration changes, a lot yeah. of these programs disappear. So That's you spend right. a lot of time and effort getting these programs up and running Mm. reason yeah if you have as you do in canada and this doesn't apply to a lot of countries if you have a solid uh, uh ecosystem of foundations grant making organizations that are non-governmental mm. tap into those because any one of them like gkff which is interested in using entrepreneurship and innovation as a way of reducing income disparities in tulsa Mm. They give you these long time uh, time horizons and funding capability that mm. can mitigate to some degree for not having that type of ecosystem already. Mm. And, and they can keep these programs alive for a lot longer to make that effort yeah. worthwhile, uh, mm. including, by the way, funding for startup companies and these types of things. Mm. Uh, the, the other thing is, I, I think it's problematic. You can look at Matter in Chicago, uh, which was started with economic development dollars. Part of the challenge when you have those economic development dollars directly in your organization is that there are a lot of strings attached. So mm -hmm. it tends to constrain freedom. Better to look at things like evergreen funds, tax breaks, and things that are available more broadly than just to your organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, maybe partner with philanthropies to make up the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's very helpful. Like anybody, like I don't know, McConnell Foundation, anyone who's interested in improving a community, this this particular jurisdiction is very diverse. Um, you know, sometimes people are necessity entrepreneurs. Like it, it, it you know, maybe there is other ways to to fund it um, between you know private sector, city foundations. It's always good to have a mix of things, I guess. Yes, uh, if, if it's okay with you, Renee, I would love to 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 get your advice on another another call. I'll reach out to you on LinkedIn. Sure. Sure, please do. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we are finishing one hour, 30 minutes uh, already. Uh, great, great discussion. I, I liked your comments. Thank you, you, Max. <laughs> yeah, great thank session, sure. Max. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Max. Thanks for organizing, man. Thanks, Max. Thank you, great thank you Max. Bye-bye.